Hey, well, welcome to our third and final program connected to Jacob Ruiz called the Other Half the Traveling Exhibit. Welcome to our Zoom visitors and to our in person guests. I am Carrie Rolander, Director of Chippewa Valley Museum. And I want to thank you to all the sponsors who have made this series possible Mayo Clinic Health System, Royal Credit Union, and Historic Preservation Foundation. With me, I have our guest, Joshua Clements. I will introduce him shortly. But before I do that, I have a reminder to our Zoom friends to make sure you stay muted. After Joshua does his presentation, he will have a chance for you to answer. Well, not to answer the questions, but to ask the questions and Josh will answer them. So, so here we have Josh Clements. Josh is the planner for the city of Altoona. He's been doing that since February of 2016. In his work as Altoona's planner, he continues to approve plans for the very popular housing and commercial developments at River Clearing and guides elected officials as they consider their priorities and concerns related to housing and commercial development in Altoona. Josh has been a leader of the Chippewa Valley Regional Housing Task Force, which brings together stakeholders across the region to understand and take action to address affordable housing needs throughout the Chippewa Valley. Josh lives with his family in Eau Claire, where he has served on the Third Ward Neighborhood Association and currently serves on the Eau Claire School Board. Well, thank you, Josh, for coming tonight, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Gary. All right. So the title of our talk here today is Ripple Effects, Urban Planning post Reese. So I'm going to start by going over what I'm going to talk about um, and then summarize at the end in, in classic uh, academic sense. Um, and before I begin, I wanted to say thank you to the museum for inviting me to speak. Uh, October is Community Planning Month, as recognized by the American Planning Association. Um, and this is an annual opportunity to um, talk about planning, uh, communicate the value of planning, and uh, engage the public. Obviously, this year it's happening in a little bit different format than in years past, um, but it just happened to line up. Let's see. So, here's the overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, we have about 45 minutes, and I'm going to try to leave the remaining balance for, for Q&A, so we'll go pretty quickly. Uh, just a brief overview of Reese's work and legacy. Uh, the legacy is very wide and very deep, so we'll just be kind of sticking our toe in at various points in time. Uh, the ripple effects um, throughout time into the present. Uh, the evolution of practice, how this has informed uh, both planning and public health and other practices. Uh, leaps forward to the present and then a charge to the graduates. You didn't know you're getting credit for being here. <laughs> so, just kind of a, a 10,000 foot overview. Um, not going to summarize all of Reese's work, but it's, you should come check it out here in the museum. Um, but Jacob Reese was a photographer and was known for um, images that he took um, over a four or five year period of time in New York City. Uh, he was also um, a newspaper editor and journalist, so he, he had quite the career. Um, and one of the things that he pioneered was flash photography uh, and new technologies in flash photography. So many of these places that he photographed, in particular the indoor ones, uh, were not safe for flash photography uh, prior to that because there was a flame and a flash and you would ignite the whole place. So. Um, he pioneered um, some, some technologies that allowed um, advances in flash photography, and that contributed to his success as a journalist and, and a newspaper editor. And it also informed many of the big influencers of the day. So New York City was kind of the crucible of community planning in this country, and, and to some degree continues to be. Um, the police chief for part of his tenure was one Theodore Roosevelt, who had to take a liking to Reese's work. Uh, and then he later worked with um, FDR when FDR was governor to implement some um, leaps forward in social policy. And a lot of those things ended up being part of the New Deal. So uh, he was a pretty influential advocate uh, based upon his work. So just a few of the representative images. Uh, these are Jersey Street tenements. 
Um, and yes, they did live in those structures that are up against the brick buildings or informal sediment settlements. So informal settlements exist all around the world and they continue to. Um, in New York City, you saw informalized settlements such as brick build, brick and mortar buildings. Informal settlement settlements, meaning just shacks, buildings, all sorts of things. Uh, informal meaning there's no plan, there's no permit, they don't really have tenure of the land, they just essentially occupy. Um, many of these tenements were not very safe, there was no real building codes at the time. Um, like I said, most of them were, were just put together um, without, without um, professional architecture or engineering that's being done. And they were also very, very crowded. So New York was where a lot of immigrants to this country arrived. Um, and so they ended up staying with friends, family, countrymen, um, and that, that led to very crowded conditions. And you can imagine, uh, especially today in the pandemic, what this was like. So there's some great material out in the museum about just the public health impacts of, of crowding like this, um, given um, the, the lack of what we now consider to be modern public health techniques. Um, there's all sorts of diseases that were rampant and mortality rates were very high. Uh, and generally speaking, the average person didn't see this because it, unless you were an owner of a tenement house, um, you really didn't get to see how the other half lived. Another example of, of his work. And I'd say, best I understand, most of his works in the public domain, so you can go um, find many of these images online. Um, he also took a lot of outdoor images. Um, he's a little bit perhaps less known for that. His, his photography of tenements was where he based his advocacy, but he's got some great photos of what street life was like at the time. Um, this is a representative sample of what street life was like in New York City this period of time. So very, very few automobiles. Mostly animal power and foot power is how you get around. But as you can see in the images of the museum and in other places, this, this type of development is pretty representative of the period from, from New York City to Brainerd, Minnesota. We, we, have, we built things uh, largely out of brick and stone, some wood uh, right, up to the, right up to the sidewalk. Uh, this is a picture of Wall Street that he took about 1900. Uh, many of these buildings are still there, some of them are not. But as you can see, pretty typical street life of the city in that period of time. Uh, this is one of Mulberry Bend. This is notable in part because this is an area where a lot of tenement housing was, was torn down and cleared because they were considered to be unsafe and based on Jacob Reese's advocacy. Uh, in this picture, all those buildings to the left, they don't exist. It's a park. It's, called, it's now called Columbia Park. These buildings to the right, they still exist today. They're over 150 years old. Um, so Reese was among the first in the US to conceive of photographic images as instruments for social change. And he used his role as a newspaper editor to, to really push that, um, that uh, change agenda. And is among the first to use splash powder photographs for indoor use. At the time, the poor were usually portrayed in sentimental, genteel scenes, often illustrated. Um, Reese shocked his audiences by revealing horrifying details of, of real life in poverty-stricken environments. Uh, he also really focused on the, on the life of children, um, and he used them in, in classic um, political messaging and saying, well, this is, this is how things are. We really need to, really need to change. Um, and at various points in time, his work became repopularized by uh, people who rediscovered it. Um, and, and notably, as I mentioned in my introduction during the, during the formulation of the New Deal. Um, so how he has rippled, his effects ripple out to the present. Uh, his impacts include public health, housing, and zoning. And there's many other things in there, into, including photographic technology, journalism, um, as I mentioned, he was involved in a number of um, newspapers in New York City. Um, so public health is kind of a big picture goal. At this point in time, it wasn't really a discipline. It was mo mostly medicine, and it, it didn't really concern as much about the health of the public as a whole, and nor was it really part of public policy. So um, early public health concerns of that day are 
we use animal power. There's animal feces everywhere. What do we do with it? It just runs right into our drinking water supply. Um, and so his, in fact, his documentation of this uh, in part informed um, the creation of public lands in upstate New York to ensure that New York City had clean water. Um, but his, his um, photography of tenement housing led to an interface between housing and public health. So building codes were becoming really important at the time. Fires were devastating cities. Um, there was connections between the disease and peak crowded conditions. Uh, and the tool that was one of the tools that was identified uh, that was being created at, at that time is zoning, um, which is a legal instrument you're probably familiar with. Um, it is often confused with the discipline of planning in general, but it's just one tool that, that planners and others use to impact uh, mostly how private development occurs um, throughout an area. So among the ripple effects are, uh, so this is a, this is how plans looked um, originally. This is a 1796 uh, plan of New York City. Um, this is post-revolution reconstruction of New York after the revolution. Um, but the social initiatives were, were a key part of Reese's work, uh, including uh, public housing, large scale infrastructure, water systems, sanitation, building codes, and others. Uh, and he had the, the access based upon his role as a journalist uh, develop, to develop relationships with, with Theodore Roosevelt and, and others who were in New York City at the time and became prominent um, nationally um, to, to work towards these social agendas. So again, a lot of the plans of the day were largely architectural exercises. Um, this, is a, this is a big map and you can actually look in closely and down to the street, but uh, all this up here didn't exist in terms of it was, it was not formally settled yet. There were informal settlements here, but New York was, was war Manhattan um, in 1807. But how cities were planned was an architect would go out and they would survey the landscape, they would, they would get the topography, and then they would lay out the streets and maybe some parks. Uh, and that's how planning proceeded. There was little thought to um, residents go here, commercial goes here, ports go there. It was, it was largely just planning for the physical infrastructure of the place. Uh, and then you know, they sold land and then that's how, how it played out. Um, so the first zoning ordinance in New York City was adopted in 1916. Um, you can still find that document. Uh, it was in, it was enforced until 1961, when it was eventually just repealed and replaced. Um, but you can look back at that document, and it has some language that you would recognize in zoning codes that are used today, including an L2 and an L3. And essentially, what it was trying to do was a measure to stop huge buildings that prevented light and airflow, and also to to move people away from living literally right on top of and within factory settings because at that time industry was completely not regulated. They were burning wood and coal you know, indoors. And so that was a huge problem for air quality, you know, all those sorts of things. So their, their solution at the time was just move people away from the industry. Move industry over there, move people over there. <clears throat> So many of the concepts that we still use in zoning to this day um, were established in 1916, in part because of Jacob Reese's work and advocacy um, with him and several others who were, who were concerned about this time. Um, the borough president of Manhattan wrote, uh, to arrest the seriously increasing evil of shuttering off light and air from other buildings and from public streets to prevent unwholesome and dangerous congestion both in living conditions and in street and transit traffic and to reduce the hazards of fire and peril to life. The law is designed to check the invasion of retail districts by factories and resident districts by factories and businesses. It is aimed to prevent an increase in the congestion of streets and of subway and streetcar sections where business population is already too great for the sidewalks and transit facilities. Um, this and this here is the first known zoning map um, so uh, how zoning works is you have a map that says 
be defined as the land by zone, uh, what is allowed to be built and under what conditions. Uh, and then there's text that goes along with it that describes what can happen in that zone. And so they sectioned off New York City, which at that time was Manhattan, uh, into these sections. And then it correlated with text that said you can build this high, you can do these certain things. And that's still largely how zoning works to this day. This led to the Zoning Enabling Act of 1922 that was written by the federal government as a standard practice. This is how communities could learn from New York. And so states across the country um, adopted these enabling acts uh, under which municipalities would gain control over land use. And there's a bunch of Supreme Court cases around shortly after this that challenged it uh, and further kind of defined um, the powers of local government. And I would preface by saying that zoning is explicitly adopted all the way back to New York City's first zoning code is to, is to preserve public health, safety, and welfare. And so work from Jacob Reese and others um, was their justification for, for why regulating private land use led was um, pursuing those goals. Jump forward. This is a, a actually shown out here in the museum. So this is Robert Moses on the top of the screen, perhaps the most controversial, misunderstood planner or person who's assumed to be a planner. Uh, in New York City, at one point in time, he held 12 titles, including New York City Planning Commissioner. Uh, he was notorious for creating and controlling um, development districts, such as bridge districts and things like that, where you have tremendous budget, tremendous power to just build things with, this, with very, little, very little oversight, particularly from the state and also from the city. Um, what he wrote in art, an article, um, which is out here in the museum, um, highlighting Jacob Reese's work. Uh, and some of the, the entries include, Reese with increasing help from influential men like Theodore Roosevelt, who was police commissioner, many of whom had not seen the dismal picture clearly until an immigrant painted it in all its ugliness, laid the groundwork for great reforms which have now passed. He also wrote that, um, in a dog eat dog, devil take the hindmost era, looking about him at the results of generations of exploitation of less fortunate immigrants, he committed himself to a proposition that a man is his brother's keeper, that the lives of the other half are the concern of the upper crust, and that prosperity based on human misery is a delusion. So that's somewhat ironic coming from Robert Moses because he was famous for destroying entire low-income neighborhoods, including minority neighborhoods, so you could go highways through it. Um, it's clear that, that he respected Reese's work and that he, he used it to uh, inform his own. Um, and consequently, Robert Moses's work in New York City for several decades um, influenced how many other cities across the country and probably across the world um, handled um, community planning and growth. Uh, another person to check in with is William White. He's a Princeton-trained architect and urbanist. And this is him on the left. And he himself used, uh, at the time, motion photography, which was relatively new in, in his practice. Uh, but he was a practitioner also in New York. Uh, his most notable work is called The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces, um, which is a book and a film. It came out in 1980. Um, William White is, is known as perhaps one of the founding um, persons related to public space design, in particular placemaking, is what we would now call it. Um, so he used direct observation um, through film uh, to study how public spaces were used. Uh, he studied it like a sociologist and over time, and so he came up with these principles of what makes a public space successful, and he had a film about it. Uh, which all planning students see at some point. Uh, you can find pieces of it online, but they are copyrighted, so I can't show them today. But um, he, he only goes through and explains, well, why, why is this principle important? One of his most famous works is the reconstruction of Bryant Park um, in, the, in the 1980s, kind of late in his life. 
So Bryant Park was a was a really rundown, very old park, one of the oldest parks in New York City. Um, and pre um, pre existed the founding of our country. However, it was drug infested. It was in a tough part of town, uh, and so he helped and was consulted with about how do we make this a, a lively, inviting, and vibrant place. And now it's a it's a worldwide example of how to do place making really well, and it's been a success for for over forty years. Uh, in fact, we used some of those examples on how do we design River Prairie and Altoona. Um, we use these same principles. We studied other parks in the region. We studied um, examples of parks that really worked well. We studied the um, work of sociologists like William White and say, well, what, what really makes a, a park or a place successful? In our case, we were starting mostly from scratch. So we weren't working around an existing park that had existed for a couple hundred years already. Um, but one of those principles was movable furniture. So if you watch a video, he describes in elegant detail more than more than I could why movable furniture is important. Because you can move it around. You have choice. You can pick it up, you can move it. You have two people, four people, five people in the shade, in the sun. Um, and so if you go there, which I've had the great fortune to do, it looks different every day because people will choose to sit where they want to. Um, and I'm sure right now it doesn't look like this, I hope, but um, the other, other principles he, he used were including food, making sure there's lots of different things to do, people from different ages, and that you have, op you have open sight lines so no one feels like they're unsafe, like they're, like they're caught. Uh, but at the same time, you need to have some sort of enclosure around the park. You need to feel like you're in a particular place. And so this happens to work because it's in New York City, so there's large buildings all around, but they also frame them with landscaping. So it feels like you've arrived in a place. It's very distinct from the area around it. So uh, as an example of not only using those similar principles of taking pictures, showing, showing people, studying, learning from them, he also advanced the practice by using new technology at the time to tell that story. So I'm trying to speed it up a little bit. Um, these these uh, people converge in 1969. Uh, William White was uh, in, was brought on to inform the plan for New York City, 1969. This was the first what he considered to be a comprehensive or master plan for the city in a modern sense. So it's a, a series of five thick tomes. Over several years, they shot short films and movies and PSAs and everything. Um, but they used photography, this is an example page, um, throughout. And so you can see a very similar in style to Jacob Reese. Um, you know, they shot people, took pictures of people all over the city um, to, to try to exemplify the diversity of the community and to tell New York City's story. And so in this plan for, for uh, the first time in New York, they're attempting to layer all the different pieces together. It's not just an infrastructure map, it's not just a land use map, it's not just public health, it's the city and everything that goes into it. But the, this, this plane is, is still lauded for its use of photography to try to tell that story. And they use that photography to engage with the public so they have a conversation about what should the city be like? What should this neighborhood be like? That neighborhood be like? What should our streets be like? What should our parks be like? Um, and it's a lot uh, more effective to be able to use images to tell that story. And New York is a big place, especially in 1969, automobiles were still not a household thing, especially in New York. Um, there's lots of parts of the city that the per average person wouldn't have ever seen. So how do you, how do you engage with community in that conversation about places you may not have been before? So we're gonna leap forward considerable distance to the recent. So now we have incredibly powerful tools in our hands um, to take pictures, take videos. Um, how do we use them in contemporary community planning? Um, that's, a, that's a challenge because the, the challenge with that is that everyone has these powerful tools. We can recruit people to share their experiences such as, you know, what have they seen elsewhere that they really liked? 
or what do they see in their own, their own community that they really like? You can share pictures of that. The same as we share pictures of our friends and our family and document memories. Um, but how do we make, how do we get meaning out of those images? You know, how do we use those in the process of telling our story as a community uh, and engaging people around um, what, what do we want the, our community to be like in the future? Or what do we want our neighborhoods to be like in the future? So uh, planners attempt to do this in a number of different ways. Uh, again, we're being stretched right now in the pandemic because we aren't able to, to meet face-to-face -face largely and look at a PowerPoint presentation or look at uh, a series of printed material just to talk about, you know, see this park and you see this, you know, this house, this is the kind of thing we like or don't like. Uh, now we're doing that all primarily virtually, um, which hopefully we'll learn from, but um, will be um, a quick thing that we can move on from. So there's a, definitely a difference between what a professional photographer like Jacob Reese or uh, many others in, in our community and practice can do, and weekend warriors like myself who are just shooting up from the hip with a, with a camera phone. But uh, these are still tools we can use in our storytelling to tell a story. Uh, and like, like Jacob Reese, what was most impactful about his work was what he chose to do with it. So he, he really took his pictures over a four or five year period of time. And he developed an entire career over saying, you know, see this situation? This shouldn't happen. And this is why it shouldn't happen. And here's what we can do about it. And he was able to, to recruit and convince others um, in, this, in this advocacy that he was effective in, in doing. So think about your own favorite places to visit. Maybe it's somewhere in the Chippewa Valley. Maybe it's someplace you like to vacation. Um, you know, how do you talk about that place and share it with others? Perhaps others who, who can't travel there or don't have the opportunity to travel there. Um, you know, we can talk about it and describe it, but it really is powerful when we have the images, when you have the images to, to share and describe what, is, what it is about that place that we really like. What about, what it is about those things that we really treasure uh, and how can we learn from that um, to improve our, improve other places. So, um, success of Reese was documenting conditions not seen or recognized by the broader public. Reese used his innovations in his work to perform as an advocate. You know, last week at that, we had the opportunity to hear from uh, journalist Julian Emerson, who, through his immersion in homelessness uh, and the exploration of challenging housing situations in Eau Claire, was doing very similar things. You know, he was going out to parts of our own, our, of our own community or at times when we're usually not there, and he was documenting the challenges that, that our neighbors um, are having in our, in our community. And he's been able to engage um, the entire community and saying, look, this is us. This is how other people in our community live. What can we, what can we do about that uh, in a very similar way? Um, so I tried to, to take, stick my toe in the water in a number of things. Um, it's a fast and, and deep rushing river. So uh, there's a lot more that, to, that we can look into any of these things, whether it's a tool such as zoning, which is a, a lot of, of what I do on a day to day basis, whether it's practice and documentation that is used in advocacy, uh, whether it's public health, which is, which is a whole you know, very complicated, well-developed discipline. Uh, how he contributed towards understanding and documented crowding, sanitation, and leading to building codes and other changes. Uh, and then how planning and public health, uh, which have kind of gone together and apart and, and together and apart multiple times throughout our professional histories uh, in, in the evolution of practice. So a charge to graduates is uh, there are incredible tools that we have to tell our story. Again, this is a picture I took with my phone. Um, lighting happened to be great that day, and there might be people in this room out there somewhere uh, in the park. Um, but we used these tools as we informed making a place, um, a place that we have to continually manage because a place is never done. Um, we continue to have to 
tweak this, tweak that, make sure we're managing it well. Um, this this saying that that most successful uh, places are public or private. Um, and I encourage you all to observe the world around you and wonder how the other half lives. So what what went into making this place? What will this place be like in the future? Um, and regardless of where this place is, what can we perhaps learn from this place that we can use um, to improve our own communities? And with that, um, I welcome your questions. Um, we have about 20 minutes. I think we're doing pretty good. And I'm let, let uh, my moderator decide, are we taking questions from the room first or from, okay, the room first. All right, so I'll repeat the question. Yes. Yeah, Joshua, I just wanted to comment that um, more than just a question, but uh, I thought you did a you know great job in uh, River Prairie Park there. I thought that was uh, that's a really nice nice place to spend time. Um, and is it complete? I know you said you you doing some more tweaking and stuff like that, but is in general it, 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 is it complete or is there more coming? So the comment question was. River Prairie seems to be a pretty great place so far. Uh, and the other question is, is it complete? And uh, the answer will always be no, because we're, we're always trying to manage the space. But in terms of the park, the, you know, the park was designed uh, and is fully constructed. So everything that was initially envisioned with the park is completed. Um, and it took several years to get there. And throughout the process, we were tweaking things as uh, throughout the way, all the way down to um, you know, this beam to, so people could walk across the creek, that wasn't in the original plan, but once the thing was there, we're like, huh, you know, maybe, maybe we need to, to continue to improve this place. Um, so I expect we'll continue to see things like that. Um, we unveiled a new public art piece um, called River Prairie Trolls um, just two weeks ago, last weekend, um, during the Giant Pumpkin Festival. So we're continuing to, to add features um, tweak things depending on how people are, are using the park. Uh, and we use feedback both from the users of the park, but also as staff observe how people are using it. So uh, if things are going well, we try to reinforce it. If things aren't going well, we say, well, what, what can we do to, to try to avoid that, you know, that, that challenge in the future? In terms of the private development around, um, so this was developed both as a park and as a development district. Um, so uh, unlike some other types of developments like this, each lot was individually sold. So although we had a master plan for the whole for the whole area, we didn't have one builder who was going to build everything, and we knew exactly what was going to happen. Each lot was was individually considered by different developers over time. So each one represents some compromises, different visions by different people as they apply to a particular space, and then the the challenge by by city staff and the elected officials is to look at a plan and their vision and look at what the what the developer wants to do and say, do, do these match? And so inevitably there's there's a give and take throughout that. And therefore, you see a, a variety of interesting architecture styles, some uses we maybe didn't anticipate. Um, so there are a few properties that remain that are not that are not sold. So uh, I believe there's two or three right now. Um, but but most of the bigger projects are, are complete here. Um, and now a lot of our focus is on how do we operate the park and continue to, to make sure it's programmed really well and continues to engage people because uh, I think the, the biggest thing about, about public spaces in general is they're, they're never done. You never can just build it and then kind of walk away. It's, you, have to, you have to manage it in such a way that it continues to be an engaging place. Uh, and that's, and we have lots of examples in, in the Chippewa Valley, such as Phoenix Park, where they're really, they're carefully programming that, that space um, throughout the year, um, and in particular winters. Winters are a challenge in this region, as everyone knows. Um, and so while winter was uh, thought a very, a very um, important feature of how we, we planned this park, some of those features didn't work out well as we had planned, and so we're, we're continuing to try to figure out how do we make sure this, this space continues to be well used in the winter. Yes, uh, in the exhibit, I was very much struck by the last panel 
with the Robert Moses uh, yeah. connection. Um, did Moses misappropriate these? I so so the question was um, the surprise of the connection with Robert Moses and. Did Moses expropriate Jacob Reese's work? Um, Robert Moses is something is a person, a personality that all um, students of community planning learn about for a variety of reasons. Um, as I said, he's a very contentious figure in, in planning history because he did some very really innovative and great things, and he also did some things that were explicitly racist. Um, and and we look can look back now and with with some. Uh, perspective, but um, I was not familiar with the intersection with Jacob Reese at, at, in my education. So when I saw this panel, it was new to me as well. And so um, I don't know um, what exactly that relationship was like. Um, that was a, a thread I was able to unravel uh, as much as yeah. I think there might be an interesting. Uh, I, I just wonder what advice Reese would have given Moses. Um, yeah, how to do how to do it differently. Sure. Well, I know that that Robert Moses was very big about about slum clearance, which was a big issue for Jacob Reese as well. Um, and in fact, Moses is, in his article um, talks about the um, Jacob Reese housing projects that are in Manhattan. And so they named some housing projects after Reese. Um, and actually, there's a there's a Jacob Reese institution there down in, in Manhattan um, that he started, and it was all about trying to help. Um, immigrants to this country um, get their footing, uh, and I again I didn't go down that that avenue of inquiry, so I don't know all, all what it is that they do, but it still exists. Um, I think you know Robert Moses is best known for tussling with Jane Jacobs in kind of their oppositional look at the world. And personally, I think that that Jacobs was not um, was not squeaky clean either in terms of her her view of things, but. Um, I think Jacob Reese's perspective was more on on Jane Jacobs' level in terms of how how the average in person and downtrodden person experiences the city versus someone who's like Robert Moses trying to move chess pieces around the board and didn't have a lot of accountability. But um, but I think it, as we unwind, it's more complicated than that. And I think that they influence each other in dynamic ways. And I think that that Jacob Reese's work influenced Robert Moses to some degree. Um, and I'm just not exactly sure, you know, how that looks. And yeah. if, if someone's I, interested, I'm sure it'd be a very interesting yeah. exploration. I, I, I've never been a fan of Moses, but yeah. in fairness to me, I think he, he was thinking regionally. Right. Um, yep. And and to lower the congestion, one thing to do is to build bridges and highways, and that will disperse the population and address some of the problems that we said that. We have a question from our online guest. No, I wanted to um, reflect on the fact that the museum we're sitting in right now is in the park, um, and maybe also currently soliciting kind of popular yes. feedback. And I was just wondering, like, Reese advocated for park space is one of the elements that was really missing from the lives of what he called the other half. Mm -hmm. um, did he advocate for asking them what they needed from their green space or did he just assign that? And how does that differ in his time compared to what we're trying to do now in the city of Eau Claire with getting more of our average citizens and the diversity of citizens involved in saying what we want our spaces to be like? Do you need me to repeat that question? <laughs> I'll, okay, I'll try to summarize. So, so the Triple Valley Museum is in a park. Um, it's in a park that was resulting from a, an era on city planning called the City Beautiful Movement. And so, um, Frederick Law Olmsted, being one of the progenitors of that movement, would be hired to go around the, the, the country and, and create these plans for the city. And he would, in particular, he was known for his parks. And um, and this park is in part inspired by his work. So the, the kind of the nebulous of the first part of the question is, did Reese advocate for parks? And did he ask, did he ask his audience, the other half, what they wanted? And in, in my investigation in, in preparing this, the answer was I'm not sure. And there's no there's no clear evidence that he actually asked people what they wanted, um, rather than 
him documenting it and making his own drawing and trying to draw his own conclusions. Um, but um, so so I don't know the answer to that. In terms of the park, so so um, this park is undergoing a new master planning process. I don't believe it has kicked off quite yet, but the city ha of Eau Claire has engaged a consultant to, to lead that process. And so they'll be looking at the various spaces in this park, which is, which is a historic park. Uh, it's been here quite a long time to try to figure out how can the next phase, next generation of this park be, be well used. Um, did that answer all parts of your question? Yeah, so, so look forward to that. Hopefully you'll see opportunities to engage and provide feedback um, to the city in terms of what future amenities are proposed for this park and how existing ones might be refreshed or modified in some way to continue to try to make, to make this park ever meeting the, the current needs and ambitions of the, of the community. Yes. Talking about the other half, um, I know Altoona developed a <clears throat> former um, assisted living in property into low income uh, apartments. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how that's working out and if there's plans for more low income housing in the Altoona area. Sure. So the uh, question was the city of Altoona purchased a, a former assisted living facility and um, made into low income housing or for, for persons who are. Of the, low, of the lowest financial means, and are there, how's that working out, and what what are there plans for that in the future? So the context is this, this building was built in the early 80s. It was kind of tired. It was at the end of its replacement cycle for a lot of things. It had been vacant for over three years, um, and it was obsolete from a from a from the use of an assisted living facility. The rooms are very small. The average size of the room is 350 square feet. So. It would just sit on the market and sit on the market. And so uh, we worked with a private developer, uh, Cody Phillips, at from CNM Homes. We tried several different scenarios of how can we make this work as a, as a place where, where persons who are the most modest means could have housing. Um, and we, um, the scenario we ended up waiting on was the city purchased the property, uh, owns the property, and then we, we, cons we contract the, the management to a private firm because we don't have property managers in in the city, um, sound city staff. So um, it's been open for a little over a year. Um, it's at, essentially at cost. So this, the city assumes that we're never going to earn back that that upfront capital. It's, it's a sunk cost, um, and so it's designed so that it just breaks even. So we get a little, we have enough margin to make sure we can replace things as they need to be replaced. Um, but then you get free utilities, free internet. Um, we coordinate with social service organizations to provide services on site um, because many people who are who may be residing there may be living on their own for the first time or the first time in a long time and they may have um, other other needs so um, it's it's challenging uh, it's a challenging population to work with in part because um, a lot of them are transitioning off of other hardships and they're and they're still working through those things um, and as a a building that we renovated, there's uh, always issues with it. There's 24 units there, um, people living in very close quarters. Um, so the, the building upkeep has just been a, a learning curve. Um, but after after about a year, we think we, we have a pretty good handle on it. Um, we have a good relationship with our building manager in terms of how do we handle challenges as it arrives. Um, and we're, we're looking at a variety of opportunities of how we continue to improve housing supply, not, not just for, for, for persons who can afford little else, but across the whole spectrum. It's a kind of a whole ecosystem. And throughout that system, there's constraints. Um, so there's, there's a few things that, are, that uh, we're working on, but not really, can't really talk about at this point, but, um, but we do work across the region on this effort. So we work with the city of Fair very closely. Um, on on housing and as well as some of our uh, nearby communities because we're all we're all in the same housing market so we can't say that Altoona's market is different than Eau Claire's market you know they're all people generally choose to live where they where they want to if they can so um, we recognize that um, we can inform in each other and when we work together 
like that, the outcomes are going to be best. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you see the pandemic influencing kind of longer term planning with regard to maybe like you know regulations on ventilation systems or spacing and that sort of thing? Um, right now, it's it's changing us mostly in terms of how do we engage with the public. So all of our meetings are, have been virtual for, since March, and they still are. Um, a lot of the public engagement that we would be doing on particular projects, we can't just do in person, which is, you know, we'd like to go to a neighborhood meeting and talk to people, meet people on site, uh, tour places, and that's been severely curtailed. Um, so it's having, we're having to really rethink those processes. And state statutes require certain things happen and so we're we have some some constraints um, and we're also working with some residents who have technology access challenges and so we're trying to navigate that to make sure that people people still know what's happening even even if they're not in that particular social media or in, in that particular channel um, from a from a widespread community planning um, sense we've been working on uh, a parks and open space plan for four years Frankly, I've been working on it for a long time. Um, and the recognition of having high quality open spaces has been key this whole time. I think what it's this pandemic has shown is that people are rediscovering the, the, some of those spaces or using them more frequently. And so a lot of the discussion is how do we how do we in, continue to improve this system in a way that's that's financially thoughtful. Um, and if anything, it's it's kind of pushed some of those things maybe forward that were kind of very long range. Like maybe someday we'll have that trail. Maybe someday, you know, we'll do that. But now it's like, no, we need, we need to do do this sooner because people are asking for it in ways that they hadn't before. Um, I mean, housing is the same challenge as we've had. We're, we're in our own kind of mini housing crunch in this region and have been for several years. So that's continued. Um, the biggest impact with that is um, for at least some period of time, construction kind of slowed down in the spring because there's a lot of uncertainty in the market and work crews were, were work getting used to working in pandemic conditions. Uh, and now just building costs are going crazy. So for example, in the last six weeks, the cost of lumber has gone up over 50%. So, um, that, that the cost of lumber is only a fraction of the price of a house, but it's a meaningful fraction of the cost of a house. So if you're gonna build an entry level house, which right now is ballpark $200 a square foot. So if a modest 1500 square foot house is $300,000, um, you add five or $10,000 on additional cost of lumber. And now you're, you're talking about something that may be a different calculation. So um, right now there's been a lot of uncertainty. The uncertainty is swung all over the place. Um, costs are, are still uh, a big challenge. Uh, and from our long range plan, I think it just elevates the importance to talk about public health where, whereas it's been part of what we're doing, it's just perhaps not, you know, the first thing we talk about. Um, but, you know, it's, it's now a, a new lens that's being applied to everything and, will, and probably will be for quite some time. Uh, and hopefully we learn some great lessons from this and how we make our communities more resilient in the future. All right, so I think we're running out of time. What are we doing? It's 6.55. So I think we have, I think we have time for one more two second question. <laughs> yep. um, so kind of connecting to like what the future, the immediate future looks like. And we understand that open spaces are really important right now. Um, so what does that look like moving into the challenging winter? Almost? Yes, uh, we don't know. Um, <laughs> but are there any fun like ideas in your packet that you're just waiting yeah. to throw on the table? Well, I would, I would encourage everyone to check out the winter mission page that the City of Eau Claire has put together. Uh, the City of Altoona is a contributing partner on that. And so this is part of a national program the city of Eau Claire competed for successfully a couple of years ago. And so that whole idea was even then public health, how do you stay active in the winter? And when here around here, it's six months of the year or so. Uh, and that, that changes everything, what you do. Uh, and one, I guess one of the, the frameworks is 
There's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothes. Um, it's part of it, uh, dress for the weather. Um, but the city is doing a better and more intentional job over the past years of making sure trails are clear, making sure parks are accessible in the winter, because sometimes we just shut, shut it down. Why, why should we pay to plow that snow, et cetera? Um, so it's, it's looking for opportunities to stay active, whether that's active inside and we can, or getting outside to walk and, and do other things. Uh, but it's, it's a challenge that we're going to live with forever. Um, and so I encourage anyone to, to find, find your passion and how that applies to Wisconsin winter. And hopefully it's, a, it's something that gets you outside and keeps you active. With that, I will hand over to Karen. Well, I just want to say thank you, Josh, for coming in tonight. And I did have a question, but I will ask you that off camera so that we can wrap it up. Um, and I want to thank all the people who are here in person and all of you out in Zoom Run for attending this final program on the Cape Blues Traveling Exhibit. Let's give Josh a round of applause. Thank you.